We are super delighted for this special session on uh, chat GPT and related AI models. And we will have two talks, one by Anton Korinek from Virginia and then Wayne Gilling from University of Texas. And we'll do two times 20 minutes and then 20 minutes Q&A. The floor is yours, Anton. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me at this conference. So I will speak about a paper of mine that is already outdated. It feels like from another epoch because I wrote it only this past February. And since then, GPT-4 has come out and these large language models have uh, become significantly more capable. But let me present about it nonetheless. So um, I'll start with kind of a broad introduction into what these models are, how to think about them, how to think about their impact on economics. I will not spend a lot of time, uh, since we have only 20 minutes, uh, on the 25 use cases that I have listed in the paper, uh, but I want to encourage everybody uh, to look this up and uh, think about which of these use cases can make you most efficient in your economic research, uh, because I believe that this is really a uh, groundbreaking revolution in how we conduct research, at least for the medium term. And uh, that was essentially my main motivation behind this paper to uh, basically serve kind of as a guide for how can these large language models uh, make you more productive. Um, I here, where's my slide here? So uh, the first thing I want to emphasize. Uh, and I think uh, almost all of you at this conference, uh, text as data, are super familiar with the deep learning paradigm. Uh, it had a significant impact on our world. Uh, but within that deep learning paradigm of the 2010s, uh, there was always still this category difference between what humans can do and what artificial intelligence can do. Uh, but now in the 2020s, uh, we are in a new paradigm the paradigm of foundation models, uh, the large uh, deep learning models that underlie uh, all these innovations in what people have come to call generative AI in recent months. Um, of course, it builds on a deep learning uh, paradigm, but it is also qualitatively different. Uh, if you interact with something like chat GPT, in some sense, it feels eerily human-like. And uh, perhaps one of the ways to understand that is that the models underlying uh, these generative AI systems, uh, they are so large that their complexity is really starting to approach the complexity of the human brain. Now, the leading category for now are large language models. And that's, of course, things like the chat GPT that we see in every other news article these days. Uh, or Claude, or Bing, or Bard, uh, and of course, the latest edition uh, powering chat GPT plus is GPT-4. So what's underlying this change? On the one hand, uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, technological improvements uh, like Moore's Law, and we know Moore's Law proceeds at a breathtaking pace. Uh, it essentially predicts and has roughly correctly predicted that computing power doubles every two years uh, for uh, chips, for cutting edge chips. But what I want to point out, uh, the evolution of these language models has actually, uh, and, and similar uh, foundation models has been much faster. Over the past 10 years, uh, the amount of compute employed to train the cutting edge uh, learning uh, cutting edge deep learning models has doubled every six months. So this is uh, yeah a lot faster than Moore's law. If it doubles every six months, we can all do the math. It means the compute employed has actually grown by a factor of thousand every five years, and. Um, we know the power of exponential growth as economists. This is really massive. And of course, it's still going on. So um, just a few uh, words, one slide on how to train uh, and uh, understand these models. Uh, most of you have probably heard these models are trained by something called self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning means that they are just fed a huge amount of data, 
scraped from the internet. Essentially, anything companies can get their hold that get a hold on that's of sufficient quality. And during the training process, uh, they are just asked to learn how to best predict the next word or the next token, technically speaking, in the text that they are being presented. And when people first started doing this a little bit less than a decade ago, uh, they didn't quite expect what would come out of this. Uh, but uh, what we uh, have now learned uh, from GPD-3 and even more so uh, the following models, that these large language models who have just been predict, uh, trained to predict the next word uh, or the next token in text, they can suddenly write whole coherent sentences and paragraphs and even essays now, and they can do a whole bunch of other things. Uh, people call them emergent capabilities because they suddenly arise once these models scale up sufficiently, such as translation or logical research or math or uh, all kinds of creative tasks, writing code um, and so on and so forth. And of course, also data analysis, which I guess is the main focus uh, of our conference here. Now, during the training process, I think the best way for understanding what the models do is that they essentially develop a world model. Because if you want to predict how text continues on the corpus of everything that's on the internet, if you want to do that in an optimal way, you need to know a little bit about the world. And so as these models are trained on more and more text and with more and more parameters, more and more compute thrown onto them, they are essentially developing an ever finer world model. Uh, and then when we prompt them and we ask them to generate uh, new text, they employ that world model to give an answer. In some ways, this really forces us to also reevaluate what our human brains do, uh, because there are some eerie parallels. And I think uh, one thing we can say is that um, the world model that's kind of inherent in the most cutting edge language models such as GPT-4 is in many ways already broader uh, and deeper uh, than the world model that, for example, I process. Like I know a little bit about economics, uh, GPT-4, knows quite a bit about economics, not as much in like my uh, main area of expertise, but it also knows a lot about quantum physics and about art and about literature and all kinds of things that I don't know. So in terms of its breadth, it has already a broader world model than what I have. Uh, now, two things that are interesting about these language models. The first thing is that all their knowing capabilities kind of advance according to fairly predictable scaling laws. So we can kind of predict if we throw more compute at this, how, will, how much will they become better? But the other thing is, uh, there are also unknown capabilities. And every time that a larger language model is released, people kind of find out things that even the developers of the model didn't know about. So, for example, when these models suddenly could translate, nobody had really specifically trained them to do that, but they had kind of acquired that uh, ability in the process of developing that world model. And um, they, that capability suddenly just emerged. And most likely, there is still significant capabilities overhang with models like, for example, GPT-4, meaning they have capabilities that we don't even know yet because nobody has tried to them out. So this is an example of uh, these emergent capabilities. They suddenly arise when you throw a certain amount of compute at the problem and then they uh, improve very quickly and then it kind of converges towards 100, uh, like in an S curve. Uh, this is stuff about GPD-4 that I will have to jump over. Um, maybe one more thing I wanted to say. So in this whole discussion about how uh, language models work, uh, I'm sure you have uh, regularly encountered that there are two, I want to almost say, philosophical camps. Uh, the first camp says, oh, these are stochastic parrots. Uh, they are advanced autocomplete. They don't understand anything. 
And the second camp that's increasingly loud is that this is essentially almost human level AI. Now, the interesting thing is um, these models, they are very easy to both overestimate, but also to underestimate. And both is quite dangerous. And I think the reason why it's so hard for us to relate to how they function and uh, how to think about them is because their capability surface is very different from the capabilities of our human brain. Um, so on the internet, for example, uh, on Twitter, there is a meme that they are essentially like amoebas monsters uh, called shoggoths. <laughs> and maybe that's a good description of how large language models work. Um, but what I want to emphasize, both camps uh, contain really a significant element of truth. Uh, so going with the camp stochastic parrots, it is true that these models, of course, still have significant limitations. The length of what you can put into it, the output drifts, training data is cut off and so on. They do tend to hallucinate and they're not always grounded in our ethical values. Now, speaking to the camp human level AI, um, there is an increasing number of people who uh, observe uh, that these models uh, really do add significant brain power. For example, the CEO of Coursera uh, was on record as saying, anybody who doesn't use this will shortly be at a severe disadvantage. And there is a growing number of academic studies that points towards productivity gains of 20%, 50% or more for cognitive workers. And as I mentioned at the beginning, my estimate as an economist is that we are at least 20% more productive if we use these models. Now, let me um, jump briefly uh, forward uh, into um, what are uh, kind of the categories of things that you can use these models for. And I'm sure every one of us has already tried out uh, all kinds of these things. Um, but what I want to encourage you, it is really useful to think systematically about what they can do for you, uh, to spend some time like going over a list of uh, what are things that I haven't thought about yet that I can use these models for. Um, and there is a list of 25 uh, of these tasks grouped into these six categories of ideation, writing, background research, coding, data analysis, and math uh, that I have listed in the paper. Uh, if you uh, have additional capabilities uh, that I have left out from the list, uh, please shoot me an email. I would really appreciate it uh, because um, I'm working on a revised version now incorporating GPT-4. And of course, GPT-4 can do a whole lot of things better. And I should say here, this table is uh, from GPT-3.5, what it could do uh, basically in November. Uh, I re-ran a lot of the tests uh, that I performed and pretty much all the scores here, I, I scored things from one to three based on how useful uh, the capability is. One was least useful, two was kind of medium and three uh, quite useful. And all the ones and twos have gone up with GPT-4. It's really a significantly more capable model. So, um, let me jump to text analysis, uh, to, to data analysis, because I think that's what's most useful uh, for the conference here. And um, there are just a few uh, quick capabilities that I wanted to illustrate. Uh, it can extract data from text, like this is uh, a simple uh, example. Uh, but it is, of course, much, much more broadly applicable. Uh, you just use um, written human text and tell it to reformat it. Uh, and here I've uh, told it to reformat it kind of in latex style with an ampersand to separate the name, the, grade, the econ grade of a student and the math grade. And it spits it out. 
short here for this illustration, but it can do this to a really significant extent. Um, and uh, a number of colleagues I've spoken to have already used this at like scale, like for uh, tens of thousands uh, of things that are being extracted from text. Uh, classifying and scoring text. This is something that over the past decade, uh, people spent lots and lots of time on, uh, starting with like n grams and so on. Uh, well, the amazing thing is even GPD 3.5 uh, can already perform classifications, uh, I would say, at the level of a human RA. So here, the example that I'm giving is I fed five tasks from ONET into the system and asked it to classify whether these are easy or hard to automate and uh, provide uh, this in comma separated uh, format, sorry, C CSV format. Uh, and what it spits out is uh, the number of the task, the name, uh, what it classifies it like. So uh, point one, for example, was classified as hard to automate. And then it even gives a five word justification for its classification. And of course it can do that at scale very quickly. Uh, for example, many of you probably have seen the GPTs uh, as GPTs paper that came out a few weeks ago. They did precisely this stuff. Uh, extracting sentiment, uh, it's also becoming better and better. Uh, so this is an example of where I used an FOMC statement and I asked GPD 3.5, is this hawkish or dovish? And yeah, it gave a, a pretty coherent explanation for why this statement is hawkish. Uh, I go a little bit into more detail in the paper. Uh, it doesn't have the ability to completely um interpret fed speak yet but it can it is really good at kind of pinpointing differences in statements and whether each difference in the statement uh, is uh, more hawkish or more dovish and yeah these are just a few examples uh math is something where gpd4 is really a significant step over gpd 3.5 so it can let me just show one example here uh, that gpd4 aced I asked it to solve a consumer maximization problem with like a uh, utility function over two tasks. Uh, the first, uh, uh, over, over two goods, the first good enters in an isoelastic way, the second linear, and it can solve that without any problem. Now, what are the lessons? In the short term, these systems are incredibly useful as both assistants and tutors, and they allow us to automate micro tasks and more and more significant tasks. So my main advice is let's focus on our comparative advantage. That means we do need to kind of consciously change our workflows. We let these models more and more generate the content that will be devalued. We human researchers, we are better at discriminating content that is a complementary ability, and that's something uh, that uh, still makes us valuable for now. Uh, and we can also give it feedback and organize projects and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of its effects on growth, I think this will really usher in a new area of rapid productivity growth uh, powered by this cognitive automation. And what I want to point out, the progress itself is accelerating because the labs working on these models are also using these models to program the next version. And they can do so much faster than before they were kind of augmented with AI. Um, in the medium term, these language models will become better and better. They will be adapted to lots of different use cases. Uh, and I think that will also kind of significantly restructure our economy and significantly restructure how we do research. And at some point, our role as humans in cognitive tasks will increasingly diminish. Uh, we will increasingly turn into rubber stampers of what the models uh, do and suggest. And um, uh, let me jump over this. Uh, and kind of end with this here. A good analogy is uh, what Gary Kasparov described after he was defeated 
by uh, Deep Blue uh, in 1997, uh, when uh, AI kind of achieved uh, supremacy in chess. So he wrote, there were thousands of years of status quo human dominance, a few decades of weak competition, a few years of struggle for supremacy, then game over. For the rest of human history, machines will be better than humans at chess. The competition period is just a tiny dot on the historical timeline. The competition dot gets all the attention because we feel it intensely when it occurs during our lifetimes. And right now, as cognitive workers, we're kind of in this competition period. But it's almost always better to start looking for alternatives and how to advance the change into something better instead of trying to fight it and hold on to the dying status quo. So there is this bitter lesson these models are becoming better and better and better, and they're also becoming better at research and better at economics. And um, the bitter lesson, as Richard Sutton described it, is that in the long term, the brute scaling of just AI systems has always been proven more successful uh, at any task, and that will apply to economic research as well. So now we have a few more years in which we humans are better at doing economic research. And there are really lots of interesting and important substantive questions brought up by these AI systems. Uh, what will they imply for labor markets, for education, for tech progress, and ultimately for social welfare? And uh, what I want to end with is an urgent call uh, to think about uh, what these models imply for our economy as long as we humans are still the best technology around to answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anton. Thank you. So we move to Wayne and then we have Q&A afterwards. All righty. Oh, just uh, close the email box just to make sure we don't get interrupted here. All right, that's done. Okay, that's good. Oh, oops, sorry. Need to share screen. Okay, I'll just move that across here. Wayne Gilling, the floor yep. is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sasha, for the uh, invitation and uh, to Elliot as well. I tend to stand up while I present because I'm not really comfortable sitting down. I, I have more energy and passion when I actually uh, stand up. So uh, hopefully you're going to enjoy today's talk. So I'm going to focus on the impact of artificial intelligence and chat GPT on teaching. This is a, a really, really important topic. So with the advent of AI, there's been a lot of panic across the world in terms of how do we actually respond to this? I mean, in the previous decades, we saw the advent of the calculator and the World Wide Web, which were able to aid teaching to make learning easier and faster. The issue with artificial intelligence is it can actually replace learning. So there's been a mad scramble across the globe to adjust to the uh, brave new world of uh, chat GPT. So, okay, so the project that I'm part of looked at the test of understanding in college economics. And so just a brief overview. So this test is, it's standard in the States. It's been used for about 50 or 60 years. And the idea is to test principles level students in America. The test itself is straightforward, 30 multiple choice questions with four options. Students typically take the two pre and post semester. And what you're trying to gauge is their learning across the uh, semester of teaching. So we got ChatGPT3 to take the two in early February this year, and it did very, very well. Uh, 91st percentile in micro, 99th percentile with macro. And this is obviously compared to uh, students who took the exam post semester. So uh, we've fiddled around with the title a little bit. Uh, Chat GPT has mastered the principles of economics. In the published version, it's actually going to refer to the fact that it aced the TUS, which is probably more accurate. I mean, so in terms of standardized testing, we know that Chat GPT 3 is significantly better than its uh, human counterparts. We haven't updated the paper to look at ChatGPT4. This world is moving way too quickly at the moment, but I'm sure if we did, 
uh, it would do even better uh, than the uh, previous version. So the implications are that educators are going to have to redesign the curriculum. Uh, we have to accept the brave new world. And for me, this challenge is no different to the advent of nuclear power. We can harness it for good or we can blow the world up. We can have cheap energy or we can uh, create uh, mutually assured destruction. So it's here to stay. So let's actually adjust to the uh, new frontier. <clears throat> so in terms of how ChatGPT3 works, um, this is straightforward for a conference which deals with machine learning because you guys already know this stuff anyway, but for a sort of generic non-technical audience, uh, the product was released in November last year. The version 4.0 was released about two weeks ago. <coughs> but pretty much this is how it works. So uh, the, the version 3.0, I mean, contrary to popular rumour, a lot of people think that it's it's a search engine and, it, and it's connected to the internet. 3.0 wasn't. I mean, I don't think it's going to be long before subsequent versions probably are stronger here. Effectively, what it does is string words together based on prompts. So the prompt that you give ChatGPT is very important in what answer you receive. The limitations are obvious. Um, 3.0, I think, was limited to information uh, at the end of 2021. I'm sure that's already different for 4.0. And the prompt is important as well. One of the important messages or implications for teaching is that the better the prompt, the better the answer. Because effectively what it does is it predicts the most probable sequence of words based on probabilities. So a cleaner prompt will uh, necessitate a better answer. <coughs> So how is this going to impact the classroom? Well, sporting metaphor, sporting cliche is crisis creates opportunity. A lot of people saw the crisis in this. I mean, there were, you know, headlines of Armageddon based on the fact that, uh, you know, ChatGPT uh, had been released. And we've already discovered not just in economics, but uh, in law, in medicine, in math, it's doing the same thing across all of these standardised tests uh, at, at the moment. So economics is not an outlier here. We are basically in the same realm as the other disciplines in terms of what GGP can do. So there is crisis and there's opportunity. So we can look at this from a short run and a long run perspective. The short run, we're going to focus on how can we minimise cheating? And I think that's the obvious implication most lecturers or educators have, have taken. But we, we can also find ways to use chat. Uh, that should, sorry, that should be chat bot in your classroom. Um, the third one is to redesign your classroom assessment. So there's three different things that we can look at here. Okay, so I'll, I'll focus on one and three for the majority of my, my talk. So <clears throat> the first knee-jerk reaction is let's go back to proctored in-person paper exams. Okay, now the irony is that uh, UT Austin, I don't need to return to this because I'm currently using it anyway. So it hasn't had any impact on my classroom. But I know that uh, many classrooms, including those at Monash, where, where I was previously working, uh, most exams are online. So this does require a bit of a, a bit of a change. Now, there's trade offs and costs involved. I mean, moving to proctored in person paper exams is not perfect. It's certainly not a flawless uh, solution here. Does it scale up? It's very easy to run an in-person exam with 15 or 20 students. What about 800 or 1,200, okay? Uh, getting the appropriate venues, having TAs to proctor the exams, printing, admin costs. There's a lot of work here involved. The other issue is, what about for a remote or online class? I'm team teaching a online microeconomics uh, course next semester with Dirk Matia at UT Austin, one of the co-authors on my paper. And we will probably have 1,200 students. So when we started this project, we went to the head of the department and said, listen, Tom, uh, we're going to need you to schedule on-campus exams for this course. Otherwise, it's simply not going to work because they're very difficult to find effective ways to assess 1,200 students who are purely online. So the department agreed and they've scheduled uh, in-person exams in the evening three times a semester. Not a perfect solution, and there'll be some pushback from students, but it's, it's, it's the least worst option that we face at the moment. So this is certainly something that we need to consider. I'm also running uh, a History of Economic Thought course next semester for the first time, and 
um, I'm going to introduce in-class writing assignments for the, for the exact same reason. I'm not sure we can trust students to write authentic essays anymore. So until I do a bit more research, until I, I, I feel comfortable allowing them to write independent essays, then I'm gonna bring some of that uh, writing into the classroom. So you can certainly use chat GPT in your teaching. Um, here's an example that we used in our paper for a first year microeconomics course. Um, give chat GPT a prompt, tell it to make a few errors. And then what you can do is basically break students up into groups, use active learning and get them to identify the errors. You could do this in, in five or 10 minutes in your classroom and you, you can change the assignment based on the, uh, on the course you're teaching, the level of difficulty. You can make it simpler, you can make it more advanced, but it, it's going to be used anyway. Why not get the students to, to, to use it in a controlled environment where you control the settings, okay? You could set this assignment up in about half a minute, okay? And what you could do is either get students to write their answers or use a, a Google uh, a Drive survey and then they could basically submit them electronically. So <clears throat> the, the, the second point relates to knowledge acquisition. Um, I think longer term, we have to think about how we want to assess our students. Now, a lot depends on, on whether it's a first year, intermediate or advanced level course, but students have to leave your class with requisite skills to progress to the next level. And obviously there are graduate attributes that we need to promote as well, critical thinking, uh, being able to write, being able to form arguments, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we need to think long-term as well as short-term as well. So by all means, we've got to take control of the classroom next semester, stamp out cheating and ensure that if chat GPT is used in the classroom, it's done so in a controlled environment. But we can also move towards experiential learning. Now, obviously I understand the, the, the trade-off here in terms of uh, assessment. A lot of lecturers prefer to have uh, heavily weighted exams because, you know, they're, they're, they're TNR and, uh, and they're, you know, excellent researchers and you no know, teaching takes away time that could be spent on research. But a, a lot of the ideas for experiential learning are actually not that costly to introduce. But moving beyond your formulaic assignments will actually help create an environment where students are not only, uh, not only do they not have the incentive to cheat, but they're actually learning more in the class as well. We want them to take agency or ownership of learning too. And if they're invested in the course because they find it interesting and they're learning things, then they will have less incentive to sort of get up to bad habits anyway. We want them to learn by doing. That's the concept of experiential learning. And the benefits are, um, are well-versed in, in the economic education literature. And ultimately, we want them building critical thinking skills, okay? This is really important because humans have a comparative advantage in some aspects of learning. Chat GPT, chatbots, AI, very good at replicating standard things, but experiential learning, which requires uh, something a little bit different, a little bit off the cuff, is much harder for uh, AI to replicate. A few examples. Here's a project that I used in my first year um, micro and macroeconomics class where the students basically take a music video and then add econ commentary to it. And it's a, it's a semester long project. It doesn't take a, a lot to set up. And I mean, it, it, it scales up. If you've got a large class, you could offer this as an extra credit project. If you don't want to grade too many projects, you can get the students working in groups of four or six. You can get your TAs to grade a lot of this as well. So it's not really a a major cost investment. Another assignment I've used, Robert Frank works at Cornell, has taught first year microeconomics for about two decades, is get the students to come up with their own question, right? And then what they've got to do is solve that question in a non-abstract, non-technical manner, which includes plausible explanations. These are two papers that I've published on them as well. So if you want to follow up, you can find these. I'm more than happy to send uh, them to anyone who's interested as well. Using experiments and demonstrations in class is important as well. Uh, again, the key thing here is to get buy-in into the course. That when the students are engaged and they're interested in learning, they, 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 once they've got skin in the game, they tend to take the class more seriously and you can get them to learn more. The other thing you can do is use case studies. Um, so all of these options, whether they be student-led projects or in-class demonstrations or case studies, are, are teaching the students critical thinking skills as well as 
boosting engagement in a particular course. So the, the, the paper that uh, we have been working on has just been accepted in American Economist. I uh, spoke to Sasha just before we started and he said that, you know, you, you work pretty fast on this. Well, we wrote the paper in about two or three weeks. Once we, once we actually got ChatGPT to take the twos, the rest of it was relatively straightforward. And the editor of American Economist said, listen, we're going to expedite this, which is great because um, if, it's, if it waits in the queue and it gets a major R&R &R and it goes back two or three times, We'll be, we'll be talking about ChatGPT 6.0 in, in, in a year or two anyway. Um, and it's had, it's had so much positive feedback. It's had five citations already. We got invited by the AEA to present this at the annual meeting uh, next January, I think is in San Antonio. And they only have one session on economic education. So um, it, it's, it's a sign here that our profession is taking this seriously. And what we want to do is help educators respond to this brave new world you know, because ultimately our, our students deserve, you know, the best possible learning. So if we deal with this situation, we can actually help them learn to use ChatGBT in a responsible manner. I think that's it. And I finished a few minutes early session. So that's, that's good for everyone.